You ready? Yeah. I'm ready. All right, let's do it. My name is Ben. And I'm Katy Perry. <laughs> you don't have nearly the rack to be Katy Perry, sir. He's Jake. And we are so glad to have you with us tonight as we talk about a wild little story about the Highgate vampire. Jacob, how you doing tonight, buddy? Oh, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing good. Why don't you share what's great within your world with the people? And then I'll share what's great in our world with them as well. All right. Well, first off, what's great in my world is you. You're my bestie. Aw, same, buddy. Uh, same. But uh, I meant more, you know, your adventures from the last night. Yeah. So last night, I I got the privilege to go with uh, Dark Hollow Paranormal again through a, through a little spook. <laughs> and uh, yeah. This one's called the Galitzen. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. American Legion. And uh, it's in Pennsylvania. There wasn't a whole lot of backstory to it. I mean, I I wasn't skeptical at all. Like, because for one, if a if if I see something from Dark Dark Hollow Paranormal, I'm I'm. I'm game for it. Yeah, those guys seem to be pretty on the stick about their shit. Yeah. So uh what happened there is it's a very old building. Um World War One era, World War Two it went through prohibition, all that stuff it went through. Mm. And uh it used to have like gangsters like um years ago they went down into the basement to like clear out some stuff and they found a large box of 10 or 12 brand new tommy guns oh like still in like the wax oh why can't i find a box like that and these people didn't even keep one they gave them all to the smithsonian bullshit gave them gave them all um some more history there people may or may not have been like moited (laughs) moited moited (laughs) and in the don't tell my lawyer we kill people man (laughs) due to the gangsters and all that stuff but um it's got a ballroom with a disco ball i was having fun with that last night (laughs) (laughs) playing with your shiny Uh, balls (laughs) and apparently like it should have clicked but it didn't until late last night that uh this lady who was there she said she used to go there as a kid and she would go roller skating Mm -hmm. after pretty much until the end of the night then i connected the two like disco and roller skating yeah that was huge yeah big time big time yeah um but so along with the gangsters may or may not have been offing people. Um, pretty sure there was booze running, they said. Oh, uh, for sure. There was a tunnel allegedly underneath the building to a different location they've never been able to find. Whether it was caved in or blocked off or, or what have you. Yeah. yeah. And... So yeah, I'm I'm assuming there was a lot of booze running. We found some really old bottles that looked the part of homemade. Um there was a guy behind the bar alone. Someone broke in through the window, shot him once in the stomach, and felt bad so he shot him again to kill him <laughs> oh sorry about shooting you bud there we'll do it again yeah Damn um it. then someone suffered cardiac arrest during a wedding in the ballroom and died well hopefully it wasn't the groom 
<laughs> no, that's more of an escape route. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so some of the things that happened last night, at first we had the mass vigil. They always start with one, and it's mm. always, well, the, the two events that I've gone to and the numerous videos I've watched, there's always something cool happening there. Mm-hmm. Um, the entire time they have a flashlight set up, a mag light, the one that you have to twist on and off to mm-hmm. turn on. Um, and they test them all in front of people. And even someone even took it all apart because they didn't believe that it could just turn on like that. Mm-hmm. Well, ain't no uh, wires or strings. That's the real deal. So they had one for yes and one for no. And uh, so they're asking questions, and it is intelligently answering. Um, sometimes you got to wait a couple of seconds. Other times, that yeah. second. That's cool. Sometimes it even interrupts you. Oh, nice. Um, they put this one girl in a back room where people have been getting really weird vibes, and a medium or psychic said there was a man back there not alive but... mm-hmm. and people just felt real uneasy about that so she went back there alone and the whole time they're asking like do you like her being back there no do you want her to leave yes and so they put this music box in there and don't you know it it's the same song from the conjuring <laughs> that music box <laughs> so it just sets the mood even more <laughs> <laughs> and uh that would go off constantly and for it to go off you have to like touch it mm-hmm. it was well away from her and she was within sight of numerous people it was just going off nice yeah and she kept saying she felt weird cold chills all that stuff and so they swapped people out nothing happened mm. um then after that, we went down into the basement, which was all dirt floors and, well, most dirt floors. And it had this weird little, like, it was elevated, but also the ceiling was lower. So you would have to, like, army crawl through there. Mm-hmm. Turned off all the lights, had the flashlight set up, uh, cat balls, music box again. All that stuff, and everyone was getting such weird feelings down there. People are seeing things. I saw things. Like, I kept seeing this, like, white shape. And you know me. I uh, I don't like to spill the beans until, like, I know I'm not crazy. Right. And people are saying they're seeing the exact same thing as me. Mm -hmm. Um, People say they're feeling like they're getting touched. Um, Flashlights are going off constantly. And then Angel of Dark Hollow Paranormal offers his (laughs) fiance and quickly turns on the yes light. And he's like, no, I'm just kidding. You can't have her, but you can have Jake. (laughs) Once again, the yes light turns on and just like illuminates for a long time. And Derek's like, yeah, no, sorry. I promised someone I'd keep him safe. Uh, You can't have him. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Um, People people kept seeing a shadow figure type thing. And... uh, in the doorway that was bolted shut Mm -hmm. and they unbolted specifically for this, but people kept seeing something move in front of the music box and the lights and stuff. Nobody was there. Um, everyone like simultaneously on the side of the basement that I was on was getting like itchy scalp real bad, which that's weird. Yeah. That's kind yeah. of a new one. Yeah, because everyone was saying they were seeing something real low, which is where I saw that white figure. Mm-hmm. But then everyone's scalp gets itchy. Mine was itchier than a son of a bee. I'm like, 
this better not be the time I have to go to head and shoulders. <laughs> Got fleas. <laughs> yeah. And Derek was having a lot of fun. He was supposed to be here, but um, light would turn on. He's like, get that fucking light out of my face. And I would turn off or like flick or dim and then just shine even brighter when he would say something like it's flipping him off. Um. Oh, one really cool thing that I forgot to mention about the ballroom is he always starts with a song. Um, Hallelujah. And the, uh, I can't remember what it's called. I made fun of it last night. Not made fun of, but it looks like the wish thing you can get off the wish with the different colors. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The EMF detector. Yeah. And, uh, that was going along to the tempo of the song like perfectly that's weird yeah and i wasn't the only one who noticed it uh but then we uh we went up to the bar area where the guy was shot twice double tap zombie land and um as soon as we sat down, Derek and I were sitting closest to the door. We hear like, because there's pool tables in there and stuff. And we hear what sounds like the clatter of pool sticks and stuff. Pool sticks, pool walls. That's a very distinct sound. Yeah. So after all that, me and Derek go in there. And Derek's like, there's no pool shit in here other than the pool tables. I was like, walk out, and I don't know why I couldn't see it before, but the sticks were sitting, like, right in front of us where we were in the bar. So to hear that in the in the other room, it used to be a meeting room. It was weird. Yeah, it's definitely weird. I wonder if they didn't have pool tables set up in there at some point. Oh, they had the pool tables in there, but... uh. Like, they were still in there when we, me and Derek sat in there for a while. No, I meant in the meeting room area. That's that's what it was. Oh, right on, right on. Okay. I'm with you but, now. Um, so we sat in there for a while, and the weird thing is, is how comfortable it felt in there. Like, we hear, we heard that noise, and, like, the alarm for the door kept constantly going off. Uh, and you have to physically open the door for it to do that. Everyone was inside. The door wasn't opening. Um, and then the music box would, was basically constantly playing. And that was set up right next to that room. And yeah, but when we went in there, it was just so like calming and relaxing. So then Derek and I went back into the into the ballroom alone. And we had we had that cat ball going off a little bit, but it was it was a great experience. So a great big thank you to Dark Hollow Paranormal. Um, check them out; they're great, great energy, great vibes, wonderful people. Thank you again for for another great experience. Hell yeah, I hope I get to meet these guys sometime. But yeah, that's what I gotta say. All right, beautiful. Now I'll share my good news for our show, and then we will uh, get into the episode proper. So my good news is that we got two new reviews on our website, Jacob. Five stars both. Ten new stars on our website. (laughs) That's twice as many as we had. And what's great is these actually came through my email literally, like, the first one, like, ten minutes after we quit recording last week. So, (laughs) you almost made it. Damn it. So, here is the first review. It is five stars, like I said, and it's titled Phenomenally Spooky. Ooh. The review reads, extremely entertaining. Definitely, definitely, yeah, I had a stroke. Definitely leaves you longing for the next episode. And that comes from super supporter Emily Kadar. 
So thank you, Emily, thank you. for your kind words about the show and leaving us a review. The next one is titled Bees Knees, which is a phrase that I have always loved. <laughs> yeah. And this one, which I will read without having a stroke, hopefully, reads, Hi from West Virginia. We know West Virginia is best Virginia. But anyway, you're from Michigan. Shut up. Don't be offended. <laughs> oh, no. I just... Everyone in Virginia will definitely disagree with that. <laughs> well, then they can leave their own five-star review and disagree with me. Anyway. Yeah, five-star. Hi from West Virginia. I found y'all's show when I was searching Spotify for the Crescent Sanitarium and kept listening because I love the vibe. I also did an overnight ghost hunt there. I definitely wanted to recommend slash ask if y'all could do an episode on the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum in Weston, West Virginia. My grandfather stayed there. No shit. And you know, my ass has to ask about maybe a Mothman slash Flatwoods Monster episode, too. Anyways, even if you don't, I'll keep listening. Love you guys. And that is from Jamie Heston. And Jamie, we love you too. And you'll be happy to know that the Mothman and Flatwoods Monster have been on the list since I started the list. And Trans Allegheny is also on the list, both because of your suggestion and a conversation which Jake and I had prior to the show. So, oh, yeah. Thank you guys so much for leaving your reviews and your kind words. We really do appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. A whole awful lot. Mm hmm. Now, are you ready to get into the uh, meat and taters, bud? <laughs> <laughs> you know I love them meat and taters. We love Starch us some, and protein. Some meat and taters around here. So tonight, I'm going to tell you all the story of the Highgate Vampire. Yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> ah! So, this whole tale takes place in London's Highgate Cemetery, which... I very much recommend any of you get on there, Google the images. It is fucking beautiful. Like, it is an absolutely beautiful cemetery. And it was built in 1839 in the village of Highgate in North London. The cemetery was built in a Gothic style. It holds 170 people in a 37-acre area. So it's an absolutely massive area. Roomy. Very roomy. It is one of seven grand cemeteries that were opened around that time period and was seen as a fashionable place to be buried back in Victorian times when they cared about such things. Yeah, nobody likes the nut-to-butt burials. Nope, nobody, nobody at all. The cemetery, because of the way it looks, has been used in multiple movies and TV series, including Tales from the Crypt. So, Love it. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of my favorites. Now, it did not take long before the cemetery had some weird shit start to pop off in there. Uh, the first account of strangeness comes from the year 1869, so only 30 years after the cemetery opened. 69. That's a good nice. thing. And what happened was that the wife of Dante Gabriel Rossetti, who was a famous painter, uh, she passed away. Nice. Sort of. Her name was Elizabeth Seidel, and he called her Lizzie. And she became depressed after a stillborn birth seven years prior and offed herself. Not nice. Please don't do that. No. <laughs> don't do that. When she was buried, Rossetti buried her with a book of poems that he had written for her. So he was not a poet, but he wrote her a book of poems and buried it with her when she died. Over the next seven years, Rossetti became depressed over her untimely death. And that caused him to fall on kind of hard times. He wasn't creating art and therefore was not selling art and his agent suggested that he go and get the book of poems back and sell those okay <laughs> not a suggestion i would make but okay different times well rosetti agreed and he dug up the coffin and what he found was lizzie to be nearly perfectly preserved Nearly. Nearly. <laughs> so, someone who was with him at the time leaked the story, and that's how it became the first report of strangeness at Highgate Cemetery. But far from the last. 
There is also said to be a vacant face spirit that just stands there kind of staring off into space. And you can get you can get very, very close to this spirit, but if you get too close, the spirit will vanish and reappear like a few feet away and just keep staring <laughs> off into space. <laughs> there is also the spirit of an old woman who is said to cry out for her children. Some of legends say that she's just calling out, you know, for her lost children, and others say she's crying out for the children that she murdered. So kind of a La Llorona situation. Mm-hmm. After World War One, the cemetery began going downhill. And by the end of World War II, it was pretty much trashed. There was trash and graffiti everywhere. Graves and crypts fell into disrepair. Mausoleums were broken into, and bodies were desecrated. And it became a meeting place for Satanists and occultists to gather. So. Damn, kids. Now on to the story of the Highgate Vampire. Which mostly takes place in 1969, 1970, 1971, but it really begins in the year 1963. Because that is when people begin reporting a tall figure. Guess how tall? Seven foot. Seven feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. People begin reporting a tall figure of about seven feet tall, shrouded in black that floats above the ground and has piercing red eyes. How can you tell how tall something is if it's floating? Well, you take the distance it's floating off the ground and subtract that from the overall height of the figure, and there you go. All right, all right. Now, who's getting close enough? Well, you'll, you'll find out. I know not all people are like us. Most people, if they see a floating shrouded in darkness seven foot tall thing you're not gonna be like "Ooh, i gotta get closer well uh in this case it's not the people that get closer to it it's it that gets closer to the people it's cuddler so we'll get into that (laughs) the first reported sighting was from a couple who were out walking their dog near the cemetery gate and they see this seven foot tall shrouded in black figure floating just inside the gate and they describe it as having a pale, twisted face with bright red eyes. Shortly after that, another man sees the apparition sliding down the wall inside the cemetery like molasses. (laughs) So very, very slowly (laughs) sliding down the wall. Yeah. In 1969, the British Psychic and Occult Society had collected a ton of reports of this apparition, and they decided to do some investigating. David Ferrant was the lead investigator from the Society, and he started going through all of the accounts, dismissing the ones that he thought weren't, you know, all that great, and keeping the ones he thought were. And one of the ones that, like, really kicked it in for him to believable was an account from a man who they called Thornton, in their reports. Now, Thornton was an accountant, so in a very, like, skeptical, very, like, you know, clean-cut type of dude. Not the kind of guy you think is talking about ghosts and shit. And he was visiting the cemetery and found himself kind of lost in there at dusk, which I can kind of understand. It's 37 fucking acres. If you don't know where you're going, you might get a little lost. Suddenly, he got the feeling that he was being watched. And he assumed it was like a groundskeeper or maybe another visitor or something like that. And he turns around and about six feet away from him, he sees a blacker than black specter hovering just above the ground. At this point, he falls into a hypnotic trance, which is, you know, something vampires are said to be able to do. And he's unable to move or speak. He describes the sensation of his energy being drained. So like this thing was just sucking the energy right out of him. Which is another thing that some vampire lore says vampires do. They don't just drink blood all the time. It's sometimes they're energy vampires. Just before he faints, the vampire disappears. At this point, Thornton regains his energy and beats feet for home. Gets the fuck out of Dodge. Gotta take that shoelace express. 
so having read all these accounts and stuff, Ferent d- decides he's going to do a stakeout on Highgate Cemetery, and he chooses the winter solstice to do so because it's kind of a high magic energy type of, you know, time of year. So he goes in during the day, and he kind of cases the place, you know, checks it out, visits some of the uh, places where people had seen shit and whatever. And while he's walking through, he finds a dead fox just laying in the middle of the path. And he checks it out, and he sees no injuries to the animal whatsoever. And then he begins to feel an odd presence. So he leaves, and he goes back later that night. Now, the the Highgate Cemetery at this time was a publicly owned space, but they locked it up at night. So he goes back at night, and he's getting ready to jump the gate when he notices that there's something moving on the other side of the gate inside the cemetery. And at first he thinks, oh, it's just, you know, like the brush moving in the wind or something like that. But all of a sudden, about five yards inside the gate, he sees the seven-foot-tall, blacker-than-black figure. Of this sighting, he said, quote, Instinctively, my conscious mind rejected this figure as being supernatural. It was more consoling to assume that it was someone wandering through the cemetery, notwithstanding that this figure appeared to be over seven feet tall. Any immediate doubts were soon dispelled when I saw two reddish eyes meeting my gaze from a, from a black mass at the top of the shape, which I took to be its head. But these eyes were not human. Rather reflecting some alive presence, they were dull and penetrating, just like some hungry wolf. Although the rest of it had no discernible features apart from a vague human shape, the whole situation seemed unreal like some unwanted dream. But, with determined effort, I tore my gaze away, realizing that the entity was malevolent and that I had come under psychic attack. Without warning, the figure suddenly vanished, and it appeared that, for the moment at least, the entity had retreated. End quote. So that's what Ferent saw. Just on the other side of the gate. After that, Ferent uh, goes the fuck home. He decides that he doesn't need to stake out the cemetery. He doesn't see the thing, right? Solid idea. <laughs> yeah, good idea, bud. So the British Psychic and Occult Society decided at their next meeting to put the cemetery on watch. And what they did was they put, like, on a rotating schedule, two people every night. So two of their members and two of their every night would be at the cemetery kind of keeping an eye on shit. Safety in numbers. They also went out to do more investigating during the day. Obviously, they're going to look around to see what the fuck they can find. Uh, While they're out there going around looking at things, they start to find some ritual symbols, like in old crypts and stuff. And they also find a right to call forth a demon ruler. So they find this written down, supposed to be like some king of hell type situation. Neat. Mm Mm-hmm. Fucking Satanist, bud. <laughs> Inviting the big guns to That's the party. That's right. Now, the uh, society concludes that only a very powerful sorcerer could work this right and make this happen. Like a professional. These, they're, they're like, oh, these are professionals. These aren't just kids <laughs> fucking around. These are some goddamn professionals. Right? Professional sorcerer. Professional dark magic users. Yes, sir. See, I tried to get into that in college, but they said they don't teach it. Well, you didn't go to Hogwarts. It's true. My owl never came. So, anyway, <laughs> the organization puts out a notice in the local paper, and they tried to be very subtle about this notice, and it pretty much just said, like, have you seen anything weird in Highgate Cemetery? Let us know, you know? And they got, like, a ton of reports from people around the cemetery saying they saw this fucking apparition right Mm -hmm. and one of the people that did not write in but who saw the reports was a man by the name of sean manchester mr manchester is the self-proclaimed bishop of the old catholic church self-proclaimed self-proclaimed and not like the roman catholic church but he means like the Before the Roman Catholic Church, Catholic Church. Oh, shit. Okay, so like the OG Catholic Church. He is the (laughs) self-proclaimed bishop of this church. OG, yeah. And he's also a self-proclaimed vampire hunter. (laughs) 
You, <laughs> you got to start somewhere. <laughs> so he reads these accounts from the paper and stuff, and he says, well, that there ain't no demon, that there's a vampire, okay? And he concludes somehow, somehow, that... Uh, Allegedly. This isn't really a regular vampire, okay? It's uh Allegedly. A high king of the vampires who ruled in Wallachia in the 1500s and was buried in Highgate Cemetery because of reasons. Now, if you're thinking Wallachia sounds familiar, that's Romania, where Dracula's from. Okay, <laughs> just so everybody's clear. So because of reasons, this high king Romanian vampire gets buried in fucking Highgate Cemetery. <laughs> okay. Shit happens. I mean, I guess it does, but that's a bold leap, Cotton. Let's see how it works for you. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so uh, after all this newspaper stuff, uh, occultism and satanic rituals in the cemetery just get to an all new level of high. Right now, not only the professionals are in on it, but the wannabe professionals are getting in on it. Uh, more graves get desecrated, foxes get killed, like just mutilated, killed, left laying around. And Satanists in the area start to send threatening letters to David Ferrant because he's like calling them out, like in the newspaper and shit. He's like, it's Satanists, they're doing, they're up to fuck shit in there and they need to stop it. Right? <laughs> the letters, <laughs> the letters are great. They, they said stuff like, quote, By your interference with the work of our high order, you have invoked the wrath of Lord Hadith. By his element and the power of the sevenfold cross, you shall now be destroyed. This is decreed by his grace, and this wish will be fulfilled through our order. Be it thus so. <laughs> so these fucking neckbeards were goddamn threatening this guy. You got OG haters in this. <laughs> What a bunch of fucking dorks. <laughs> I just, I want to find who wrote that letter and just smack them right quick. <laughs> like, fuck's sake. You're going to have to travel to a lot of basements for that. I want to meet this Lord Hadith motherfucker and just kick him right in his taint. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Shut the fuck up. The uh, British Psychic and Occult Society, to give them all the credit in the world, were just as not phased by these letters as I would be. You know, <laughs> like, fuck you guys. So, during this time, the, the media is, they're writing papers about the stuff going on at Highgate Cemetery and stuff like that. And they're interviewing David Ferrant, and Sean Manchester, like, gets his fucking face out there in the news, too. And just to make it clear... In the interviews, David Ferrant is saying it's Satanism and they've they've called up a demon. That's his official in the news position. Sean Manchester says it's a fucking vampire. That's his in the public news position, okay? Well, the two of them get invited to interview for the same channel at the same time. Oh, and they're boy. doing the interviews on, like, opposite sides of a parking lot, Okay. <laughs> Now, during the interview, Ferent explained, again, his theory about it being a demon brought forth by occult practices and on and on and on. And he's very calm, very cool, very collected dude, right? Sounds real legit. Manchester, on the other hand, was just kind of yelling about fucking vampires, right? <laughs> Sounds fucking crazy as shit. Now, Ferent, at one point before this, had been asked about Manchester's vampire theory, Okay. And had jokingly said that if it were a vampire, he would hunt it down and stake it himself. <laughs> so he says this, like, just kind of tongue-in-cheek flippantly. But during the interview, Ferent overhears Manchester say that Ferent is a fool for trying to tangle with the dark powers of the great high vampire king. So Manchester apparently took that seriously, I guess. Now, Ferent claims that Manchester said to this news report that David Ferrant was going to lead a hunt for the vampire on that very night, Friday the 13th of March 1970. Ferrant had no such intentions because he didn't think it was a fucking vampire. And he assumed people knew this, right? So he goes home after yeah. the interview and kind of forgets about that shit. 
But that night, he goes to Highgate Cemetery because it's his turn to keep watch, and when he gets there, he is greeted by hundreds of people in various states of inebriation. And they are all there to hunt a vampire. How else do you hunt him? <laughs> so, you can't do it sober. I guess. Or by onesie twosies, you gotta have an army of drunk folk running around hunting vampires. Grab your torches and pitchforks. There and you steaks. go. There you go. Garlic and steaks and torches <laughs> and pitchforks, folks. That's right. what we're doing. And Garlic steaks. Somebody bring the beer. Now, <laughs> what, one of these people was 25-year-old history teacher and self-proclaimed vampire expert Alan Blood, who had traveled 50 miles to hunt a vampire and had brought students with him. <laughs> Some responsible teachering right there. I like this. I wonder guy. what kind of extra credit he offered to his students that were brave enough to come along. <laughs> A's throughout school if you're the one who stakes the son of a bitch. Stake the vampire. You get a 4.0 in my class. Period. Dot. You never have to do anything again. Die. You fail. <laughs> That's an F. Now, of course, the police were also there trying to keep order on all these fucking people hanging around Highgate Cemetery, but it didn't work. And they were fairly quickly overwhelmed by the crowd. So all the people flood the cemetery and they just wreak fucking havoc. Like, they're busting into tombs, they're fucking turning, just anything you can think of. They are just looking everywhere for a vampire, okay? Which they did not find, according to all reports except that oh. of Sean Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> this fucking asshole <laughs> claims... Sorry, am I giving away a little too much when I say this fucking asshole? Claims that during the hunt... He finds his way into a tomb, and inside he meets a beautiful young blonde girl who was stuck in a psychic trance. This beautiful young girl leads him through the catacombs of the cemetery until they arrive at an old sealed vault. Finding no other way to get into this vault, Manchester climbs on top and punches a hole through the stone ceiling of the vault. <laughs> and then <laughs> he ties a rope around himself and lowers himself in. Inside, he finds an extra empty coffin. And in this extra empty coffin, knowing that it's the resting place of the Highgate vampire, he places garlic and holy water to prevent the monster from returning to its resting place. <laughs> Allegedly. Alleg <laughs> so, <laughs> what a fucking. It gets better. Sean Manchester is the best character in this. He's a fucking idiot. <laughs> Any thoughts so far, Jacob? Uh, a few. Um, <clears throat> so, for one, I want to thank Sean. Manchester or Winchester. Yeah, Manchester. Yeah, I want to thank him for all him being the reason that we're all still alive. Yeah, he's a fucking hero, bud. Who knows he where probably, we'd be without Sean Manchester. Right. When the planet flooded, he probably pulled the drain. Um, He probably gave the olive branch to, uh, to the dove. <laughs> this guy this fucking guy <laughs> i hope he's still alive because i want to have a garlic beer with him yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you guys that's another guy you guys should look up like google highgate cemetery pictures and then google image search sean manchester s-e-a-n just in case you're wondering uh yeah you'll just just you'll thank me later <laughs> just go ahead and give this guy a google <laughs> yeah. i have to now Fuck, please do <laughs> I'll continue with the story while you do that. Let me know when you have thoughts. Uh, now, in August of that year, two local girls are walking home from school, and they see the corpse of a woman who had been drugged from her grave to the middle of the path, decapitated, and had a stake through her chest. So that's kind of the type of stuff that's going on after the, the uh, big vampire hunt, even though the media kind of quit covering it, covering the Highgate Cemetery stuff after that. The British Psychic and Occult Society, 
kind of take this stuff as a sign that the Satanists are gearing up to do something big. And they decide that enough is enough and it is time to act. Jacob, I just saw the look on your face. Are you looking at pictures of Mr. Sean Manchester? I am. And your thoughts there? <laughs> well, you know, for this feller to punch a hole through the through the cement uh, tomb or whatever, he's, <laughs> he's on some uh, high-performance drugs <laughs> because he's... He's a scrawny little feller. Not exactly Captain fucking America, is he? <laughs> no, no, and it looks like he has lived a rough life. Lack of sleep and uh, vampire hunting will do that to you. I mean, I guess. And he's kind of got Bob Ross hair. <laughs> Only there's no happy little trees in this story, just happy little vampires. <laughs> Well, so I just found this newspaper clipping mm -hmm. with him standing in front of the family vault of Sir James Tyler uh -huh. holding a homemade crucifix <laughs> and a wooden stake. Mm -hmm. And he's dressed, he's shrouded in black. <laughs> oh, this guy, I love him. This fucking guy. I want a beer with him. Yep, I have found a Bob Ross hair one. Yep, yep, he did. In the 70s, he had Bob Ross hair, but I think he went bald <laughs> after a while, and he just starts wearing this stupid little hat, and, like, priest robe thing. I don't know what the fuck it is. Well, on this one, he looks like the Simon and Garfunkel guy. <laughs> <laughs> yep, Simon and Garfunkel. All right. Or, or that one guy, uh, Billy Madison. The the guy who's trying to take over the hotel, you know who I'm talking about? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The weasel yep. turd. Yep, he does kind of look like that. <laughs> yeah, and I think weasel turd's a good good fucking call. Anyway, <laughs> so the British Psychic and Occult Society, after taking seeing signs that the Satanists are gearing up big time, uh, decide it's time to do something, and they had been planning to do a ritual for a few months. So what they do is they infiltrate the cemetery by the light of a full moon. Okay, because again, full moons are very strong, magically speaking. And they create two circles. One is a circle of protection, and the other is a circle of binding. Now the plan is for the society members to stand in the protection circle and trap the entity in the binding circle, and then exercise it. I'm, I'm kind of with it. You're making a face, but I, I'm, I'm, I get what they're doing here. They're standing in the protection circle. Yes. While trying to bind it in the binding circle. Yeah, they're trying to draw it into the binding circle. Uh, just like, hey, bitch, come here. Hey, come here for a second. Ha, you stepped in the circle. Yeah, it's not a great plan, but I get what they're trying to do here. All right. Okay. okay. Provoke the son of a bitch. Exactly. So everything is going pretty well. They got the circles drawn. They got their sigils up and all that stuff. And then the cops show up. <laughs> <laughs> no, because after everything that happened The cops started watching the place pretty heavy And they did hop the gate to get in Right Now, according to the police report David Ferrant was arrested that night Inside the cemetery With a cross and a stake Ferrant? Ferrant was arrested, yes That's public record He was arrested with a cross and a stake According to the police report Poor K Well, because he was in the cemetery now my question is not why did he get arrested why was he holding a cross and a stake that's what i'm saying like because he didn't think it was a vampire right yeah well here's his explanation he said this is what he said happened that night okay the group that he was with when they heard the cops coming and saw the flashlights took off running towards the oh. other end of the cemetery because their their idea was to get out on the backside. But he he thought he was a bright fella, okay? He was going to do something even trickier. He ran towards the cops. Not to cause a diversion, but <laughs> because his plan was to jump the wall as the cops came around it and then escape behind him, right? Not a bad plan, but the walls are like 12 to 15 foot tall. <laughs> and David Ferrant, who you can also Google and look up, is a little white British boy, not a fucking NBA player. So there's no fucking way he was getting over that wall like that. So along the way, did he stop to pick up a wooden stake? Nope, I'm getting there. Okay. 
so he says that the cross was because demons, and that checks out, right? Yeah. And that it was not actually a stake, but instead was like a ceremonial piece of wood that they used to inscribe the circles and the sigils in the ground. Okay. So that kind of makes sense. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of with it. So he gets arrested, he gets tried, and he gets turned loose because technically he wasn't doing anything illegal. They locked the cemetery up, but I guess it was not technically. It's trespassing at best to be yeah. in there when you're not supposed to be. He wasn't destro caught destroying anything or anything like that, so they they just cut him loose. So, at that point, the British Psychic and Occult Society decide to, like, back off of everything. You know, they don't want the bad publicity and things like that. They don't want to get in trouble. Now, in October, BBC One investigates the cemetery and documents the desecration of the cemetery. So all the trash shit and the fucking broken headstones and the broken into crypts and all that. And they invite Ferent onto the show that they're doing. And he talks again about it being Satanists and how they summoned a demon already and yada, yada, yada. Now, unlike his previous interviews, this time Ferent does not get not one single threat from the Satanists, which is something he takes to mean that the Satanists are up to something big and can't be bothered with his ass anymore, right? So he takes this as a warning sign. After this, a young woman was walking home past the cemetery at night and sees the tall black entity, right? Now, she's outside the cemetery. She sees it. That's the same thing that happened to a lot of people, right? But this time, it came at her and threw her to the ground, <laughs> The entity approached her slowly until it was looming over top of her. When suddenly, the headlights of an approaching car fell on the entity and it vanished. The driver sees the girl on the ground and sees a shadowy figure disappear and he is freaked the fuck out and he stops and helps the girl up and takes her to the police station where they file the report. Um, the report does say that she had like you know, scrapes and cuts and lacerations, you know, that would happen from being thrown to the ground fairly hard. Yeah. Uh, the police go, they search the area. They don't find anything, right? Because it's a vampire. Then police right. aren't real good at finding those. Or a Absolutely. demon or something. <laughs> Who knows what it is? <laughs> but after reading about this, Ferent and the British Psychic and Occult Society decide that they have to do something no matter what. Ferent says that it was at this point that he realized he needed to use high magic instead of the low magic that he had been trying to use before. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it sounds funny, but like if you look into occult practices, they do talk about high and low magic and, you know, things like that. So, okay, I'm kind of with it. I'm not making fun too much. It's just kind of funny to say. So in July of 1971, they set up a real big ritual with physical talismans and candles and everything, and they bring a medium with them to help summon the specter. So they set up, instead of deeper in the cemetery like last time, they set this up right at the fucking gate where the entity had been seen most often. They begin their incantations, which they call the commands of manifestation. <laughs> Suddenly, it gets freezing cold and a mist blankets the area. Through the mist, they see a dark shape begin to appear, followed by glowing red eyes. Ferent says that the entity did not exude an evil presence, but felt more like a void that was sucking the energy from all those gathered there. At least one, if not multiple members, fainted but everyone was in such a deep trance that they don't even notice their comrades hitting the ground right away. Yes, Jacob. Uh, it's just, it, I'm getting flashbacks from the last story you did. The, uh, the visitor. Oh yeah. But that, he, that, that guy got farted at. Right, right. That's what I'm, <laughs> like Maybe vampires got some stinky farts too. No, Knock nobody says nothing out. spelled. This guy, this, this thing just sucks the fucking energy from you. Hmm. Like, Feeds off energy, I right. guess, is what they're saying. Anyway, Ferent manages to pull himself out of this hypnotic state, and he gets the medium back on focus as well. 
and the two of them perform an exorcism. But before they can finish, the being disappears. Go figure. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, they conclude that this half ass exorcism will make Highgate safe, but that the entity is still around some fucking where. Right? They're not sure where, but they figure he's not in Highgate Cemetery anymore. They decide to ramp up their investigation. Right? They want to find this thing, get rid of it for good. But before they can, the two of the members of the society get arrested and the society shuts down. I don't know what they got arrested for, but that was pretty much it for fucking the British Psychic and Occult Society and for David Ferrant. That's his part of the story is pretty much done and gone except for the book that he wrote years later. Now, back to vampire hunter extraordinaire Sean Manchester. <laughs> Who is also an author on this, I saw. He very much is. Oh, I'd love to read his book. Like, I can tell there's no hero complex with him at all. Oh, no, not even a little bit. And we're going <laughs> to confirm that as I finish out this part of the episode. <laughs> Thank goodness. Okay, so... Manchester claims that Ferent and his peeps failed fucking miserably. They fucked it all up, according to Mr. Vampire Hunter Manchester. According to him, he claims to have chased the, vamp the vampire across the earth for the next 13 years. <laughs> I know this is so full of shit, I can't fucking talk. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Eventually... After 13 years tracking it all across the world, he tracks it back to England, and not just to England, but to London, and he finds it in an old building in London's Crouch End. The way he tells the story is that he tracked it there, and he walks in, and he sees the coffin where the vampire sleeps, and he kicks the coffin open, like Roadhouse, not just opens it, kicks it open, Roadhouse is the coffin. And inside the coffin, in his daily slumber, is the king of the vampires. <laughs> and he acts quickly and decisively, and he chops the head off the king vampire, and he stakes it through the heart, and then he sets it on fire. Now, that should be the end of it, right? You, I, I would hope. You would think, but it's not. I certainly would hope. It's not. Because you remember that pretty blonde girl from the Highgate Cemetery? I remember. Well, after 13 years, she's still with the King Vampire. Her Promoted. name is Louisa. And she's still under the vampire's spell. And when the King Vampire dies, the evil inside of him enters into Louisa. And she transforms into a giant spider. Okay, okay. <laughs> Come on, Stephen King. <laughs> wait, wait, we're not done yet. <laughs> this really happened. Sean Manchester said this is how it happened, okay? She transformed into a giant spider. So did it. And Manchester Pennywise. does battle with this gigantic spider. And he wrestles it and he fights it until finally he is able to stake the monstrous creature through the heart, breaking the spell of the evil from the vampire. And the giant spider turns back into Louisa and they live happily ever after or whatever. <laughs> Please pick me. I have a few questions. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. Yes, Jake. Okay. So one, I want to know, what did he cut the head off with? Well, fuck, I don't... Probably his bare hands. He just ripped it Most off. Likely. Okay. <laughs> All right. Did he get the uh, steak from, like, dead phoenix ashes, or... It might have been a... It might really have been a unicorn horn. We're going not that steak. route. Okay. Sure, why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> if we're making Highness. shit up, we might as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The horn of unicorn... Or well, the... And the unicorn gave it to him. Okay. That's very important. Yeah, and he had to break the spine off of the blade. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm this getting guy. it on this one! <laughs> this fucking guy. <laughs> like, literally <sighs> went to the plot of Pennywise right there. Well, all... Well... 
I yeah, it's... yeah. The book probably came out before that, but yeah, no, I don't know what fucking plot he was going to. There's more than one plot where giant spiders exist. Lord of the Rings. There's a giant spider. Yeah, she she goth. Or... She lob. Yeah, she lob. Yeah. Now, I've I did an episode on vampires. Mm-hmm. I did a lot of research for, for that episode. <laughs> Not fucking once did I ever hear a one turning into a giant spider. Well, you didn't read Sean Manchester's book, did you, Chief? I did not. Yeah, should have, because you'd lo- you'd know a whole lot more about vampires, wouldn't you? <laughs> I fucking guess. <laughs> Chop a head off, stab it through the heart, light the uh... son of a bitch on fire after Roadhouse and his home open. The second home he destroyed too, because remember the first one he punched a hole yep. through the stone roof of the vault. Man, he is a man. That is a man's man, right? Fucking there. So like, I've heard some, <laughs> I've heard some shit in my day. <laughs> what kind of fuckery is this? <laughs> this guy, he doesn't have a hero complex. He's got a freaking uh, god complex. Oh god, this guy's fucking something else, ain't he? he? <laughs> He is definitely the reason we're all alive. Imagine if he wasn't here, mm. we'd be dealing with king vampires and giant spiders. And I mean, that's real. That's real. Whatever the that hell else he's real. killed in his day. <laughs> what else is he? Is he a werewolf hunter? He might be. You never know. Is 13 he years, he might have had to do some other stuff, you know? Yeah, I'm I'm assuming he's the reason why dinosaurs aren't eating us too. He could be. Just Sean Manchester just walking around just I'm the king of the castle and you're the dirty rascal. That's all there is to it. That's Sean Manchester right there. <laughs> yeah, we should have been telling Sean Manchester jokes instead of Chuck Norris jokes. Damn. <laughs> I got, I can't. That's my favorite part of the story, just because he's such a fucking douche nozzle. <laughs> he turned water into badassery. <laughs> Good God! Oh, I can't. <laughs> I can't with that motherfucker. <laughs> the blade of unicorn. <laughs> the stake of phoenix ash. <laughs> Carved from the last ancient type of sequoia Ooh. holy tree. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Aside Did he from... also skull fuck it? He might. <laughs> <laughs> so aside from Sean Manchester, what do you think, Jacob? I mean, it's got enough witnesses for me to believe something was going on. I would more go on the end of a uh, parent or parent parent. I feel like even his story's embellished a little bit. Yeah. You yeah. But mean? like, but... I feel like it would be more of a demonic entity. Yeah. For real. More than a vampire. Cause like, yeah. Cause like I've heard of the vampires feeding off of energy and like, I've also heard a lot of spirits, demons, that stuff feeding off your exactly. energy. And like this vampire stuff literally came from Manchester. Just like he knows exactly who it is, where it's from, probably got its birthday. Yeah, and I have no idea how he concluded what vampire this was or anything. Where it's from. He's just like, nope, that's what it is, motherfuckers. Yeah, Dracula's uh, right-hand man. So I'm going to go punch a hole through this stone-ass crit in my ass, you fucking wiener. Yeah, Yeah, I bet in the book it says that it was 12 inches thick, too. Probably was. And and his his blade from the unicorn was probably (sighs) spherical. It was a staff. He chopped his head off with a staff. 
That's how badass this he guy just is. He used his penis, he said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he mushroom stamped his head off. Just the massive girth and length of his wiener. <laughs> he just dropped it on the vampire's neck and decapitated it. Oh, with yeah. his manhood. <laughs> <laughs> the only man enough to wield the Manchester weenie is Manchester himself. <laughs> Goodness, the taters on you, Jam. <laughs> okay, so with wow. That, with that, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed our show or any of our shows, any of our episodes, please leave us a five star rating and review either on our website, paranaturalpodcast.com, or on Apple Podcasts if you can. If you can't, or if you do one of those and want to do a little bit more, just share the show with a friend. Uh, that really, really helps us grow pretty much more than anything else. And with that, I will say thank you so much for listening. Until next time, good night. Thanks all for listening, and thank you, Mr. Manchester, for saving the world. <laughs> Love you guys. Love you, Manchester. You fucking liar. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> <laughs>